Hi everyone, I'm Crystal King, and I'm here with uh, my friend Katrin Schumann. Say hi. So I'm Katrin, um, and this is my book. It's called The Forgotten Hours, and I've published other books before, nonfiction, but this is my first novel. So um, it's very exciting for me. It comes out on the 1st of February. Um, it is a contemporary book. It just happens, uh, coincidentally, to be extremely relevant right now. Um, it's the story about um, the fallout on a New York family when a young uh, teenager accuses her best friend's father of sexual assault. And um, so there you go. It just happens to tap into um, our discussion um, in in our culture right now and uh we'll see yeah. what people say about it when it when they start reading the story yeah um i i just want to say but as we as we start to like get going is that i your book is like it's some it's a book i keep thinking about i really oh that's good uh, to hear it, it is it's something that um it's a really tough topic and one that i wasn't sure i wanted to read about because we're so overwhelmed with all the me too stuff these days but yeah i began reading it i could not put it down it was so <laughs> riveting and you just handled some really tricky some really tricky um, relationship issues with, within your book in a way that I just thought was so artfully done. And I, I was, it, I really loved reading your book and I keep thinking about it. So. Wow. That's, that's great to hear. Um, that's like, the, isn't that the one thing you really want is pe readers for your book to somehow touch readers in whatever way is relevant to them in their lives and to have them be thinking about it and reflecting on their own lives and their choices and, how they see other people and how they see the world. So that's, it's great to hear. And I have a question for you. Um, this is about writing. So I want to know, uh, I'm always really curious about how other people are, how they write. And so I want to know if you're a pantser or a plotter. Um, well, uh, my, my approach has changed to writing actually. Um, and in the case of this book, um, I, this book has a dual timeline like your book does too and or multiple timelines and we'll talk about that but because of the dual timeline um, it meant that I really had to be more organized about what is happening when um, because with as you know with two timelines you have to make sure that each one feels really relevant mm -hmm. um, and that they kind of speak to one another um, as well as to the whole story um, so I knew pretty early on how I wanted the, the, the timelines to play off one another. And what really took a lot of organizing was um, putting into there what bits of information I was ready to allow the reader to fully know. Because the story is told from a very limited perspective. It's told from the, a young girl, young woman, 24 years old, whose father is just getting out of prison. So she has a very set idea about what's happened and she has a kind of limited perspective. So in a way, the reader sometimes knows more than the main character does. Um, and that was a bit tricky in terms of mm -hmm. uh, organizing and, and planning um, the plot. So, I mean, I guess the answer really is both ways, both the pantser and, and being <laughs> organized. And, and, and um, I used Scrivener, which was extremely helpful to me because I it allowed me to move big chunks around um, without losing track of where they were. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So and tell me about in, in your book, how you managed that, because you've got a lot of different things going on at the same time. Yeah, I have a bit, or, a bigger, a bit of a bigger gap in mind. I think your, yeah. your gap is like, what, nine years or something yeah. like that? Um, that you're going back and forth between the timelines. Mine's, mine is spans like 50 years. Yeah. And so um, the book begins, this is not too much of a spoiler because you learn this within the first like paragraph, um, but Bartolomeo Scopi, who is this celebrated chef, he's dead on, um, and his son, or his, um, excuse me, his nephew Giovanni is um, there and trying to be reeling about this scenario. And from there is where everything starts to split. And so you have a timeline where Giovanni is moving forward, but he's discovering everything about his uncle's life moving backwards. Yeah. yeah. So I had to figure out where all this 
bits. And so I had to plan a lot of it. And, uh, and then moving around and figuring out when you get to learn some of the things in the past was really yeah. tricky. Um, and I even, even down to the very, you know, last edits, um, there was a really crucial chapter I have in the book that I had really early on because I thought it needed to be, some of the information should be um, revealed in a somewhat chronological way, even if you were in the past. Mm -hmm. And my agent and my editor were both saying, no, 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 you've got to hold this chapter until close yeah. to the end. And, and so I ended up moving that whole chapter to the end because revealing it sooner took a little bit of the oomph out of the story. And so, right. um, but the pant, the pantsing is the fun part. I think when you yeah. sit down and you're yeah. just like, Whoa, where did that come from? Yeah. Like um, my first book, when I sat down and, and was writing parts of it, I would step away from the computer thinking, oh my gosh, I just killed that person. And I didn't know <laughs> <plan on> that. <laughs> yeah. I love the process with this book of my final edit on it because I felt like I had uh, sorted out how I wanted the story to unfold and those sort of technical aspects of, of plot and what you reveal and when I felt comfortable with. And then I felt like it, it was sort of like entering this magical kingdom where yeah. I could, I could elaborate and I could cut things out and I could tweak this and I could add a little detail and I could really sort of focus in more on creating a strong sense of atmosphere. I could play with language much more. Yeah. Um, so that for me, that was a great relief having the plot element um, behind me and being able to play around a little bit and have more fun with characters and language and so on. Yeah. I think editing is way more fun than sitting yeah. down and putting it out there. <laughs> yeah, that blank page. So that brings me to a question. Um, so your book, which is um, clearly very heavily researched, um, I've often wondered uh, how much do you find that the research helps or hinders you? Like, do you ever, and do you do all the research before you even start writing? Uh, you know, and how do you pick what you want to include and so on? I think even now I still find things I wish I could stick back into the book, but mm. I think the research is an ongoing process, but I try to do as much of the research, a core part of the research before I start. Um, usually with my, the books that I write, I have one or two things that attracted me to the story. And I know a little bit about the character, the, the main person I want to write about. Mm -hmm. And then I have to figure out what the story around that person is. And so um, I start looking at history and, and seeing, okay, this person knew this person and they worked for this guy and um, he was living in this city at this time. And then I tried to look at all of the, the people that were in the sphere and the events that happened in that time. So for example, in um, The Chef's Secret, there's a comet that appears and the comet appears at the beginning of the book and yeah. it, it frames the book. I it, love that, yeah. It's at the beginning of the book and the end of the book, but this comet was a real comet. It, in 1577, which is when my book is set, there was a comet that appeared and was in the in, it was visible by all of Europe for 74 days. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that is so cool. I'm gonna stick that in there. And then I had to figure yeah. out how to make that work. Like, what would that be like? And then, um, so when I wrote um, Feast of Sorrow, my first novel, I really struggled with too much. And my writing group was always like, you've got to tone this back. It's really nice, but it doesn't lend to the story. So I was a lot better in the second book and figuring yeah. out, okay, how do I include details that are relevant to the story and not just interesting to me? Because yeah. I'm not uh, somebody teaching you history. I'm somebody that's telling a story. So how... How do right. I accomplish that? And so it took, I would say it was practice and mm -hmm. I'm probably going to always need an editor that says, yeah, that scene just doesn't do much for the book. It's nice and pretty and fun, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I did a fair amount of research myself, but I found that what was most helpful to me was uh, research sort of putting myself in these situations. So in a way, I wasn't researching facts as much as I was researching the experience yeah. of something like I went to a courthouse, I looked up transcripts. I had that feeling of, of going into the, the 
up the stairs and into the big building and putting your stuff through the, um, you know, the um, whatever. Yeah, metal detectors. The metal detectors <laughs> and so on and feeling nervous even though you haven't done anything wrong. And, um, and I also taught in prisons um, to, to just sort of be able to feel what it, it would be like. like to be so out of your um, comfort zone. Um, and that really helped inform my writing. But then I also had to hit up a, a, a friend who's a lawyer and another one who's a judge and just make sure that you've got the facts right. Because if you're writing something contemporary um, and you've got some facts wrong, you're definitely going to hear from your readers. Yeah. Uh, somebody will know that obscure thing that you got wrong and they'll point it out to you. Oh, I yeah, remember Julia Glass. Yeah, Julia Glass once said that um, she doesn't do research before she writes. She writes first and then does her research. And I thought that was really kind of interesting. Yeah. How you let your characters lead and you're not inhibited by, by sort of facts and truth. I mean, I couldn't do it that way and I'm sure you couldn't, but yeah, it's kind of the kind of book I write. I can't do that, but. Yeah. So one thing I really thought was so interesting about your book was the way you look at family and family has different sort of definitions there's like blood family and there's there's family in terms of the relationship that two people have with each other like the slave boy um and giovanni and um and there's this issue of lineage and patronage and what family means and the definition of family tell me a bit about that as a theme as something that you were interested in yeah so i think um in particularly in in Italian culture, um, mm -hmm. and even up, I think, even up into modern times to some extent, the idea of vendetta is something that's very deeply built into the culture. And we actually see this in all the mob, sh mob movies, right, that we've grown up wow. watching. Um, but the idea of um, loyalty to your family and loyalty to um, uh, particular uh, that that blood relationship is really important and even yeah. so, and that is like a really deeply set cultural thing and it goes back centuries so back in ancient Rome um, if you so the, I, I, I demonstrate this in Feast of Sorrow um, if you were um, did something really terribly wrong and were going to be executed for it, they would not only execute you, they would execute potentially your entire family and your, to eliminate your bloodline. So your bloodline could not continue this horrible thing that, it, you know, they believed that the sins of the father were the sins of the son. Like you could mm -hmm. not escape this sort of like terribleness. So the idea of being honorable to your family and honorable and truthful was something deeply ingrained and is probably still to some extent. Um, and so that made that makes for interesting stories because mm -hmm. your motivations are really different than maybe somebody who grew up in America and a more traditional setting. And we are not always as deeply loyal to our families as we might mm -hmm. be, you know, as, as sometimes they would have been in the past. And so I explore that. But then they also had this really interesting culture cultural um, acceptance of bringing people into that family and bringing mm -hmm. them into the fold and um so caesar uh, uh augustus um when he didn't have any heirs he adopted caesar you know he adopted tiberius and adopting a family in to carry on the family name was uh, adopting someone in to carry on the family name was really yeah. important that name means yeah. so much it almost means more than the blood in some ways so mm -hmm. um, i explore that in the chef's secret as well um you know how do you carry on the name if you don't have someone to do it so yeah, yeah it's it's interesting i think um the idea of family in my book is really um has a lot of really interesting complexities but you've got a, a really interesting family structure as well because something really terrible happens in the family that is in the center of your book and how you have to reconcile what that loyalty is yeah. in your family and so you have a, almost the opposite in a way how do you how do you how do you be loyal when you don't know if you should be yeah like, that had yeah, to so be really crazy to explore I, it, it was kind of mind-bending um because what i wanted to look into was if if your own experience with uh, 
a family member or somebody that you love or a friend is a good experience. So if your memories are filled with, with lovely memories of somebody who has taken care of you and watched over you and been generous, uh, obviously you're going to have a, a certain perspective on that person. And um, especially within families and with friendships, there's a, there's a, a great, um, people are very proud of their ability to be loyal and generous and empathetic and stand behind someone when they're um, having a tough time and so on and so forth. So I wanted to push that to the limits, basically, to, to show that people are, as we all know, people are really complex, yeah. but people can often be both good and bad, obviously. Um, and even the people that we rely on and love, like our best friends or our parents, can do things that shock and disappoint us while still being good parents, let's say, or close friends or, um, you know, a, a wonderful, generous lover or, you, you know, so that's, that's what I was mostly focused on looking into, how disorienting it is when we have to redefine how we understand somebody who we really love. And in my book, it doesn't, it's not just uh, a question of the main character, Katie, and her father, who is the one who uh, was accused and ultimately convicted, um, but it's her relationship with her mother. She comes to discover that the assumptions that she's made about her relationship with her mother are kind of off base. Um, and it's about her relationship with her best friend, who's the one who makes the accused accusation against her father. She has all sorts of assumptions about her best friend that are kind of rooted in in her being young and naive and not really fully understanding having a fully mature perspective but you bring that along with you into adulthood that that memory of somebody um and that causes you to make certain assumptions about how they are um and equally she has to sort of reassess her relationship with her first love too she's got this very romanticized notion of this boy that she had a crush on back um, when it all went down, and um, and she has to reassess that too. Uh, mm -hmm. So I tried to look at it on multiple levels, not just uh, Katie's relationship with with her father, John. There's also this element of you know I think as we grow into adulthood, we realize that the adults that are that were have been in our lives are not as put together or yeah. as knowledgeable or as straight and narrow or yeah. you know, we realize that um, people are not exactly what we thought they were when we were children and yeah we that really interest in an interesting way I think well I remember the moment when I realized that my parents and in particular I remember this with my father was a, a normal fallible human being um, and it wasn't until I was well into adulthood, basically. Um, so I, I think that's a very good point. We do, we, we're always, when our parents are still alive, we're always still children, no matter how old we are. Um, and in this case, Katie is 24 years old and she's a young woman. She's been through college. She has a, a, a strong relationship with somebody and she's, you know, launched into a career, but she's still her father's daughter and mm -hmm. she's still her mother's daughter. And navigating that under the circumstances that she's in is really tricky. Yeah. And I think a lot of people experience that it, it, in different ways, not just in this kind of story where there's this heinous accusation and, and um, you know, it, it, it all goes so, so wrong and we're trying to figure out what actually happened. But in many different ways, just in ordinary life, we experience this too. Tell me, when you start something new, do you start with character or do you start with the plot or do you have like a scene or a particular moment in mind? How does it work for you? I thought it was really interesting that you wrote from a male's perspective. Um, well, how did that come about? The people I'm writing about are men. I mean, uh, for yeah. me, I have an idea of my next several books actually. Mm. Um, and they're all historical figures. And, and it's not that women weren't 
involved in these lives of these people. It's just the stories that eventually were told or the things that were able to be accomplished happened because they were men. And mm -hmm. to tell the story from somebody else's point of view, at least so far in the books I'm writing, feels disingenuous. Mm -hmm. And so it is unusual, I think, right now in the world of historical fiction for, um, uh, for, there, there tends to be more stories being told from a woman's point of view because women tend to be the biggest readers of historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that might be because of the point of view that it's being told at. So uh, I, it's funny, I don't know if many men get asked about where, writing from women's points yeah. of view, but women always get asked about it because men have been writing from women's points of views for centuries. So, you know, yeah. there's that, yeah. but for me, I have this, I have its character. I find the, the, yeah. the, I have the person. I know the person I want to write about. I know a little bit about the, what he has accomplished and what he's done. And it's an inch that alone is pretty interesting. So I want to find ways to bring that out more specifically. And then I find other, other pieces to that story. Um, in my third novel, I know that I wanted to have a stronger woman character in the book. Mm -hmm. And so the character that I have, she was not, she's not a real person at all, but she figures very, very prominently in this particular book. It's almost two stories. It's almost her story and his story. And so, mm -hmm. um, and that's been fun because yeah. um, I, I just knew I needed a strong character in the book. And, um, something really horrible happens to this character within the first, when, when you first meet her, she's in the, she's oh. in a situation that something really terrible happens and it defines who she is. Mm -hmm. and she is for the whole book. And, um, and I don't even remember how I figured out that I wanted, Oh, I think I know what it was. I was watching a TV show and um, there was something that happened to a certain character. And I was like, and that, and it was reversed for that character in the, in the I'm not going to tell you what it is until you read the book. <laughs> the situation that character found herself in was reversed. And I was like, well, what if it wasn't reversed? And what it was, what if it was in 15, you know, 40, 1535 yeah. or whatever, and, and I had to figure out how to medically make this work for this person. How would, what would happen? And so that became the seed for this character. So I think it's, you know, the influences from all sorts of areas. Yeah. But like, so I, one thing I'm so curious about is why did you decide to write this book? Like what, what compelled you to explore this story? Yeah. I mean, now to think about that, given that this is such a big conversation nationally and internationally, you know, now we're all thinking about this. Um, but in the many years that I spent writing this book, um, I did sometimes wonder, you know, I, I was like, why am I, you know, obsessed with this topic and really willing to spend so much time um, and, and, and effort trying to get it right? Um, and the answer is basically, as I've come to understand myself, is that I write because writing is the way that I wrestle with uh, difficult and interesting issues. Uh, and usually in one way or another, it's because it's something that I've experienced myself uh, somehow, um, even if it's sort of secondhand, um, but some challenge uh, that I have gone through. And, and sometimes it's not even, um, sometimes it's just sort of in my head and I'm struggling with figuring something out. And I discover that I'm writing characters who are doing the same thing. Um, and in this particular case, I went through a period in my life where uh, just coincidentally, I had two very close friends who both were dealing with this type of accusation in, 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 but on totally polar opposite ends of the spectrum. And in both cases, they were very close friends and it elicited ex very strong reactions from me. Uh, and I was deeply involved in, in what ended up happening um, for both of them. And so I started to think about what I think of as the peripheral victim, which is all those people who are not at, uh, to whom the crime hasn't happened, but who are somehow involved with the person who's accused of a crime. And it, yeah. it doesn't have to be this particular crime. It can be any kind of crime. You know, anybody who 
who goes off the rails and commits a crime has this uh, extended network of people who are involved in, in their lives in one way or another, whether it's husbands or wives or children or friends or co-workers or whatever. And it really hit home to me when I saw uh, Jerry Sandusky, do you remember yeah. him? Yeah. Uh, when his wife was interviewed on television, this was while I was writing this book, um, and there was a snippet where where she looked at the camera and she was sort of totally confused and she said you don't understand that's not the man I know and I and that moment was really heartbreaking for me because I thought to myself she she knows this man in a certain way mm -hmm. and that way doesn't allow for these other stories that are real that really happened um, and we can't really blame her for having such a narrow view yeah. because her experience of it is real. And I think that's kind of mind bending, you know. Well, and also there might be a piece of that person who knows that maybe it's not real, but is clinging to, yeah. you know, nobody, we did, none of us like change, right? We're not. Yeah. Well, that's, an, that's another thing that I experienced um, viscerally, which is we're invested in believing that people are who we think they are because yeah. it reflects on us and it, it, it reflects on how well we can judge others, whether we've got good instincts, whether we're good you know, at, at, at seeing who's valuable and who's worthwhile having as a friend or, or remaining loyal to. And sometimes we're really wrong about that. And we we, um, you know, sign up for the wrong thing and, right. and learning, learning that we're fallible and, and being willing to accept that, that we're not always right in our instincts um, or in our choices. That's a hard lesson to learn too. And I wanted to explore that. And Katie, the main character in my book, really has to wrestle with that. She has to yeah. um, come to terms with the fact that um, on many different levels, she, for perfectly good reasons, came to the wrong conclusions about a number of people. Yeah, and I think, well, I, I actually explore a, not quite the same theme, but the idea that um, when you when somebody discovers that the people in their lives are not at all what they thought yeah. they were, and um, how do you like navigate that? And uh, I, I, I have, I have some firsthand experience with that, not with my, my own family, but mm -hmm. um, it is really hard when you realize that your worldview totally has to shift because what your understanding of the person is, is so different. Like it can yeah. come so much. Yeah. Very yeah. definitely. Yeah. So, um, so I have a question for you. Um, uh, so your book is not quite out in the world yet. So mm -hmm. you're, I mean, it sort of is actually, I saw that yeah. you're like, you're an Amazon first read this month. Yes. right? Which is so cool. Right. I loved getting yeah. that email and there, here's your book in it saying, you know, she, you know, go pick this book to read up if you're a prime. Yeah. If you sign up for Kindle, um, the Kindle service, the Yeah, Kindle. Prime. Yeah. yeah. So I'm so excited. Um, so you're starting to get reviews, right? Yeah. And um, so do you read them or not? Uh well, I swore that I wouldn't, and then of course as you probably know, it's just absolutely impossible not to want to know what people are thinking about your book. I mean, I always, I always come back to the, the reason we write is because we want to share these ideas with people. Yeah. It's, it's partially for ourselves because it helps us work out certain issues and, and obsessions and so on, but it's also because we really want to connect with, with people. Um, and with readers and to get them thinking. And so in my case, um, I, I have read some of them, but to be honest with you, what I find is it's not helpful to me to read the reviews uh, from people who haven't liked the book. And the reason is that I, while I understand on one level that not everybody can like a book, and certainly for me, I have very strong opinions about books that I do like and don't like, um, what can I learn from somebody who hasn't really enjoyed my book? You know, I've already gone through the whole process of editing and, and getting feedback and I've, and almost every critique that a reader can come up with is something that I myself have already considered. And I've made the choice that I've made in the service of my story, um, 
hoping that I'm making the right choice. Yeah. So that's a long way of saying um, I like to read the good reviews and, and I, <laughs> I'd like to avoid the bad ones. How I about always, you? I always, so I, I can't not read them. There's just no way. Um, uh, but it's really shifted my whole way that I review books too. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, I know so many authors now that, but being an author myself, I, I suddenly realized that so many book reviews that I gave over the years, I didn't really consider that there's probably somebody like me sitting there mm -hmm. reading all, all of those book reviews. And I'm yeah. really baffled by some of them, right? Um, yeah. The ones that are like, you know, give it one star, but they like really just, you know, read two pages and couldn't get into it. I'm like, then don't review it. It's just, yeah. don't do it. It's not your book. Just yeah. so. Well, it's an, it's an intimate experience reading, writing a book and reading a book. And I think that people feel cheated when they don't like a book and they, they feel like somehow it's, it's an emotional thing and they feel kind of cheated and they do sort of forget that there's a person um, who spent maybe years yeah, working incredibly hard to get it right, and maybe they didn't get it right. Um, but people seem to forget that, and 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 can be a, a little harsh in their in their judgments. But equally, I've been amazed. I mean, it's been so much fun to read the good reviews, and literally a thrill to read these reviews that point things out. When I'm thinking, yes, that's yeah. exactly what I wanted. You know, I wanted you to think about this relationship, or, or what I can do actually is where people have highlighted um, on their Kindles, mm -hmm. uh, I can see what's been highlighted, and that's totally thrilling because I remember even with sentences thinking, oh, is that too much, or right. you know, should I maybe edit that well, out? People will highlight like two pages of my books. I'm like, yes. What's it's really when I read those passages, I'm like, why did they highlight that? Like, what was happening yeah. on that page? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's a fun feature um, to to really get granular like that and to see what people have appreciated in terms of, you know, sentence by sentence, word by word, language, and so on. So, yeah, but the the experience of connecting with readers is very interesting. I think on Facebook, um, I'm I'm enjoying that. I'm really looking forward to this next stage, though, where I get to get out there and talk yeah. to people, and where they can ask me questions, and it can be a little bit more like human, human to human. Um, I haven't done that yet, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. You're I I think um you know you only get to be a new author once. I mean like a new novelist once. This yes. is really not your first rodeo from a book perspective, but this That's is a little true. different because yeah um because you have people that are reading it in a real personal intimate way like you were saying. So I think yeah it feels like a pretty different experience to me um, than the nonfiction books that I've published. Um, it, it, it's more personal. It's definitely, um, I, you know, you pour yourself into these books mm -hmm. um, in a way that I think um, is a little different in, in the nonfiction and the collaborative work that I've done. So it's good to get this first one out there and develop a thick skin and do some celebrating. <laughs> Well, I'm going to see you in a couple of weeks at your launch, and then uh, we'll just carry it on through February. Yes. Yeah. Well, great chatting with you. Yeah, this is super fun. Um, I, I mean, I, there are so many questions I had been dying to ask, so I'm glad that I had the chance to do that. Yeah, me too. And I can't wait for the next one. You are very industrious. Do you have a working title yet? Not a title, but it's about... Vincenzo Cervio, who was a carver to um, Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, who was the wealthiest man in Italy. Oh, okay. It'll be fun. More good stuff from Crystal King. Excellent. <laughs> well, nice to chat to you, Crystal. Thank you so much, Katrin. I will talk to you later, and all thank right. you all for joining us. Take care. Bye.